All right, it has been quite some time since I've done a live stream here in the studio like this. Um, I've just finished a workout and I thought before I go home, let's hop on here and have a little conversation about strength training for us runners. It's something that a lot of us, well, most of us know we should be doing, but I think an uncomfortable number of us, if we all put our hands up and we're totally honest about this, would probably say that we're not doing quite enough of it. I've definitely been guilty of that in the past. And what I found really interesting is the fact that about, what would it have been, about a month ago, I suppose, I put a link into the community tab here on my channel. I also sent a link out to my email list. You know, that's, uh, that's many tens of thousands of runners in an email list who got this link asking them to fill out a survey specifically about their strength training and why they do or don't do enough of it. And the answers, um, the responses that I got were very, very telling. So I think, like I said, most of us will admit that quite often it goes missing in the training week and we don't do quite enough. But I want to dial down and really dig into why we don't do enough strength training. What are the reasons? What are the, for want of a better term, excuses? You know, what's the truth behind, other than the fact us runners, we love to run and Running is what, we, what, what we're here for, what we want to do, what we enjoy doing. The strength work is kind of a necessary evil. But beyond that, what deep down stops us? And there are a few things that came out of that, of that particular survey. Again, a few thousand respondents, so a good sample size. And the key points were what follows. So firstly, it's time. That's not a shock to anyone. Okay, we're all busy, especially when I then subdivide the respondents down to those of us who are over 40. So kind of busy working parents. Yeah, time is the one asset that we're all really struggling with. I get it. But we'll talk about that in due course. There are kind of ways around how to kind of manage your time to, to actually fit in some strength work rather than just allowing it to completely fall off the radar. The next one, what I found really interesting was overwhelm. Okay, we live in this kind of world of Instagram and YouTube and we're being told constantly about, I should be doing this exercise, I should be doing that workout, blah, 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 blah. And obviously as runners, there are so many different parts of the body, some kind of obvious ones, but other different parts of the body that we probably should be working on, let alone what the physio tells us based on our own strengths, weaknesses, injury history, all that sort of stuff. And in fact, before we go any further, let me know in the comments how often in the training week, you generally manage to get any kind of injury prevention work, specific strength training done. I'm not talking about kind of stretch after a run. I'm talking more so about like making dedicated time for these kinds of exercises. Let me know in the comments, I'd be fascinated to know. Natalie says, this is so true. I'm, I'm really glad that, um, really glad that that resonates with you, Natalie. It's, um, when I saw the results to the, the survey, it just, yeah, I was like, okay, this, this does make sense. Um, and, and where I want to go with this and what I'm talking about tonight isn't just saying these are the results, but actually these are the, the workarounds. These are the things that I have found and that I've managed to put together, which will help you kind of get over these, these speed bumps. So time being number one, overwhelm being number two. <sighs> There are so many different things that we're told we need to be working on as runners. It does get quite overwhelming. It does get quite frustrating um, to the point that, especially if you don't have, I mean, I'm, I'm lucky I do have a sports injuries background um, or perhaps you've got a background, you've been training for years and years and years. You've seen the physio so many times that you've kind of got the collection of exercises that you know these are kind of going to work in my weak links. But if you haven't got those kinds of things, then how do you know which exercises are going to be worth it? Which exercises are going to kind of miss the mark? Which exercises are going to be really, really good use of time, really effective, really efficient? Again, it is so hard to know. So again, that's something I want to kind of move into in a second. But I think the key point is that we all know that it's important. We all know that from a strengthening point of view, it'll help us improve performance-wise as runners. If we're able to maintain good form for longer, if we've improved from a resilience perspective, we don't find the ends of those long runs so hard, etc., etc. That's great. But injury prevention for me is 
the most important reason that we should be doing these exercises. Okay, and I always come at this sort of thing, whether we're talking about strength or talking about running form, I always come at this from an injury prevention perspective first because to sort of, to, to lean on the performance gains and say, right, this is the benefit, you'll be able to run, run X amount faster over Y distance, I find that really hard to, um, to kind of justify when actually what I believe with this is if through getting your strength work right, getting consistent with your strength work, getting diligent with your strength work, making time for it in the week, alongside, as I said, that the same conversation could be had for running form, if through that you can break down less often, get injured less often, then that in itself is going to mean that you're taking less weeks off training every year or every month. <laughs> Some people are injured far too frequently, but you're gonna take less time off training. That means you get more consistent with your training. And it's when we're more consistent with our training, whether we're doing you know, specific, let's say half marathon training, we're really gearing up for an event, or whether we're base training and we're just doing lots of long, slow, low heart rate training. Either way, when we're consistent, that's when we see those performance benefits. So yes, the performance side is there, but for me, injury prevention is absolutely where it's at with this. And what's really crazy is that us runners, we know this, but we're not great at following through and being consistent with this type of training. Okay, Michael says two or three times a week with this. Uh, Mike says, hi. Hi, Mike, how are you doing? Um, and Natalie says once per week is kind of where she gets to with this type of training. So the first thing that I really want to get across is that I'm a big believer in little and often. Okay, I think a lot of people, those who answer in my questionnaire, they answered time is the issue. When I've spoken to a few of those folks, I've followed up with emails, they've said that they try and fit in when they can, a kind of a 60 minute, a 90 minute workout in the gym once a week to supplement their running. And that's great, I'm all for that. That's, if you've got time to do that, great. And if you're doing kind of whole body, fantastic. If you're doing run specific, fantastic, whatever. Strength work, I, don't, I never see a downside to doing strength work. But if, as busy as we all are, that hour all of a sudden gets rather difficult to achieve, or that 90 minutes gets difficult to achieve, it falls off the plate. I would much rather take a little and often approach and say, right, how about you give me 20 minutes, two or three times per week? Can we be consistent with finding 20 minutes? That's watching a YouTube video for a lot of kind of running vloggers out there. Um, you know, they're making 15, 20 minute videos. Um, it's watching a short TV program on Netflix, okay? And you're doing this work in your living room. If we can carve out that time to do two or three of those in the week, it's going to allow you to be more consistent than having to find a more chunky standalone workout, a more standalone session, which quite frankly is harder to find time for. So if you can manage to do that, then that in itself, even though you're not doing this beast of a session, this mega kind of epic workout, that in itself builds up over time. And even though that, you know, two or three, two or three workouts of 20 minutes per week, you're not gonna hit every single area, every single workout, every single week. If you structure it right, across the course of eight, 12, 16, 24 weeks, where you've been consistent at just nailing those down, you will be hitting all the right areas. And again, I've got a program which I wanna show you later on, which does exactly that. Okay, little and often for me is the key. I've been working with runners since 2007, and especially as I'm coming from this kind of coaching meets sports injuries kind of place, I know that the biggest issue, particularly when it comes to injury prevention and rehab, and giving people home exercises to do, the biggest issue is what we refer to as compliance, you know, getting people to actually do their exercises. And when questioned about, why haven't you done your homework? Or when, more like, when you get someone coming to you from a, a physio who they're no longer working with, and they say, yeah, I just didn't, I just didn't do the work. Um, hands up, you know, it's, I just didn't do it. When questioned about that, though usually the reason is, he gave me like 20 exercises, and who's got time for that? So it's, it's all the same thing. I like to boil it down. I like to say, right, what can we do to really move the needle? Which exercises can we do to really move the needle and give you specific exercises that will only take you 20 minutes that you can do two or three times per week 
to really start building some momentum, some consistency, building some resilience, building some bulletproofness in those legs. And actually that's a really unintentional segue. Um, I want to show you down in the, in the first link in the description, there's the Bulletproof Runners program, which I'm launching at the moment. It works on exactly this principle. At the moment, it's on a pre-launch offer. Okay, so I'll go and check that out if you're interested because it does specifically deal in this little and often principle and this principle where it's all about building consistency rather than asking you to find an hour here, 90 minutes there, which I just, I think for most of us runners, those of us who are kind of, you know, my age, perhaps a little bit older, life is busy. You're not gonna find quite so easily, quite so consistently, those big sessions. And you know what, if you can, fantastic. I am jealous of you. But for most of us, it ain't gonna happen. So that, for me, is the start point, the little and often. And then it's picking the right exercises. Okay, if we can pick the right exercises and cut through that overwhelm, then we're gonna start seeing progress. A lot of the time as runners on Instagram, on YouTube, like I said earlier, we see this exercise, that workout, and it, it just becomes kind of white noise. You're kind of drinking from a fire hose in terms of training advice, which isn't overly helpful. So picking the right exercises to work on key areas that, again, leveraging my experience, leveraging the, the length of time I've been doing this, I know what the areas are that us runners typically need to work on. Okay, so it's, it's posterior chain, it's glutes, it's hamstrings, it's calf complex, okay, it's core, it's lower back. It's, in many cases, it's also kind of adductors as well, but it's picking the exercises that will start undoing a lot of the imbalances that as 21st century runners, we find ourselves struggling with. So I'm sitting down right now, you probably are sitting down right now, you might not be, but you know what I mean. We need to undo a lot of the um, well, yeah, imbalances and, uh, and, and kind of soft tissue issues that we build up. Because as much as, as much as some of us run a lot, let's say you're doing 50, 60 miles per week, which is a good amount of running, that amount of running in comparison to, or the time that amount of running takes in comparison to everything else you do in the week, it's actually quite small. Okay, so all the other muscle imbalances, let's say you spend a nine to five sat down, five days per week, that isn't going to be mitigated by you getting out and doing, I don't know, 50, let's say 40, 50, maybe even 60 miles per week. And I know, I appreciate most of us aren't doing that kind of mileage. I'm just trying to use a kind of bigger number to, to kind of hammer the point home. It's not going to be undone by doing that. But what we can do is we can say, right, these are the, the lifestyle factors that most of us have to deal with. These are the imbalances that most of us have to deal with. Combine that with the fact that Again, there are a handful of different imbalances that as runners we have to deal with. What are the exercises that are going to really make the biggest bang for the buck with those? And it's not about getting you doing, you know, big kind of lunge variations right off the bat and doing lots of exercises which are really going to take it out on your legs, especially if you're in the middle of, let's say, a marathon training block right now. It's not what I'm talking about. In fact, with the Bulletproof Runners Programme, we start right at the very start right with the basics. It's the stuff that, quite frankly, a lot of the time people miss. A lot of the time, even people who are being coached, people who are you know, under care of, of PTs or physios or whatever, what have you, sometimes we find ourselves leaning towards the exercises that feel like we're doing a lot of work. Exercises that feel like, yeah, I'm getting strong, yeah, I'm really starting to feel the, feel the benefit here or feel the benefit to come here even more so. Um, and we miss we miss those kind of more nuanced exercises, those kind of foundation exercises. And if you can get those foundational exercises down, okay, you have some of the ground-based exercises, you know, bridge variations, sideline leg raises, those sorts of things, and even more basic stuff, almost kind of Pilates type exercises where you're learning what it is to actually switch on your core correctly. The number of runners I've met who, they do so much core work, but you ask them to actually show you how they engage their core and they, they, they can't do it. Um, so they're, they're doing all their core work with their kind of more superficial core muscles rather than switching on those deep core muscles. Um, it's, it's frustrating. So I wanted to dial it back with the Bulletproof program and the beginning is foundations. The beginning is getting that initial fundamental set of movement patterns and exercises right so that we can then build upon that over time.
I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm rambling a little bit, but hopefully you see where I'm coming from. I want to make sure that <clears throat> people who come on board with the program, they're taken through a steady progression. They're starting with those basics and then building on that to then build the strength that we need as runners, the stability, the balance, the core control that we need as runners. Because there are so many different facets that build a strong runner. <coughs> Sorry, I seem to be choking for some reason. Anyway, I'm on my soapbox a little bit. I'm, uh, you can tell I'm passionate about this stuff. But let's answer a few questions, common questions about strength training that I know will usually come up. And why don't you in the comments, if you have any questions about strength training in general, let me know in the comments. But at the same time, answer me this. For you individually, which areas do you feel specifically that your body needs to strengthen? You may, have, you may feel this inherently, like just intrinsically, you feel like this is an area of weakness, or you may have been told this by a physio, a PT, whoever, a, a coach of some variety perhaps. Um, let me know what, what areas you specifically know you need to work on. So we have from uh, Kato, you go to the gym three or four hours per week. My friend, if you're able to do that, you are clearly managing to do something very right with your scheduling. So congratulations. I think a lot of us would love to be able to go to the gym three or four hours per week. Um, Reese says your goal is three sessions per week, usually at one or two in. Analysis paralysis can be the problem sometimes. My man, I completely agree. Analysis paralysis, we kind of, should I do this, should I do that? And we end up just choosing nothing and we've agonized over what I should do for half an hour when you could have just done a, a half hour workout. We've all been there, I'm sure. Not just in this instance, but in so many facets of life. Um, so, all right, let's, let's just deal with a few big ones. First and foremost, where in the training week we put these, these sessions. Okay, now, I'm a big believer when working with this little and often, in fact, this works really well with this little and often principle that's in the Bulletproof Runners program, is that we leave a clear rest day in the week. Okay, some people will say, that if you're training, um, let's say you're training five runs per week, uh, and you've got two days per week where you're not running, but you, perhaps the training you could do for those days is a little bit of cross training, a little bit of strength work. I would rather actually full on ring fence one of those days and just say, this is recovery. Recovery is my job here. This is what I do. Um, and just don't, don't stress your body. Just allow it to get that recovery from the training that's just gone. Instead, Knowing that we're talking about 20 minute workouts here, I'd look at where in the week, so I would avoid alongside things, intensive sessions like track sessions, and I'd avoid extensive sessions like long runs. But other than that, where in the week can we add in 20 minutes on the end of a, you know, a midweek four miles, let's say, or, you know, or a recovery run after a long run on a Monday, something like that. Those sorts of sessions where we can just tack on that little bit of extra work before you, before, you go, before you pick up your phone or before you open your email app. Yeah, I know. Um, if you can do that, then that's going to make a huge difference because it won't then eat in to those rest days. All right, let's quickly have a look in the comments. Um, we've got Hayden saying that hamstrings and overall ankle mobility is an area that he needs to work on. Um, Kerry says hello from Oz. Hi down there. Right, and Jim says you try to strengthen your hamstrings uh, specifically, although you do all muscle groups. You have an anterior pelvic t uh, tilt, and Athlinex says to strengthen as opposed to stretch hamstrings and core. Yeah, if you've got an anterior pelvic tilt, you're not going to benefit from stretching your hamstrings. I covered this in a video maybe three weeks ago now. I'm saying pretty much exactly the same thing. A lot of people feel like they've got tight hamstrings because their pelvis tilts forwards. And in fact, those hamstrings are just being held in a lengthened position. So stretching ain't gonna make that any better. Instead, working on what's pulling that pelvis forwards, so tight hip flexors, weak core, tight lower back, they're the things to work on to allow those hamstrings to be put in a happier, healthier position. Right, uh, Max says Sundays are a strength training day and uh, you work on legs and hamstrings and glutes mostly. Cool, fantastic. How about if we manage to get a bit more consistent with that and on top of those Sundays, 
We also threw in something midweek on a kind of a, a low training load day midweek and started just again getting you doing a little bit more in terms of strength work, perhaps just seeing the benefit of going to two a week with that. That second one, I don't know how long your Sunday session is, but it sounds like you're in a good habit with that. But that second one would only need to be you know, a little 20 minute workout. Okay, let's have a look at what Liam is saying. Three SNC sessions per week, one heavy lift day, two days away uh, from either track session, a power based SNC. Oh, uh, hang on a second. One heavy lift day, two days away from either track session. Okay, that makes sense. Keeping away from those intensive sessions. Uh, power based SNC midweek, pre track, and core mobility later in the week on your run test day. Interesting. It sounds like you're on a very structured program there, Liam. Um, I'd be interested. Let me know in the chat what you're training for at the moment. And, um, and well, yeah, I wonder if you're a collegiate athlete. I'm not sure. Let me know. Let me know. Okay, dokey. Ah, Frank, let's talk about weights. Excellent. If you're working weights, do you keep increasing weight slash reps as you get stronger? Or do you get to a place where you're just maintaining kind of depends where you are in terms of your um in terms of your training cycle okay so i wouldn't go nuts in terms of just continuing to go up and up and up in terms of the reps okay i don't see much benefit in terms of that but in terms of increasing strength and just incrementally adding the weight i would go down that route more so but just be aware that after a point, you're also going to start impacting the quality of your run sessions. Okay, so you might well get to a point if you have a phase of the year where you're seeing progress, 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 progress in the gym with your weights, you're lifting more. And let's say you're doing out and out strength work, you know, doing five sets of five for your kind of big compound lifts. So you're finding that you're lifting heavier, heavier, heavier. Great. But alongside also trying to bump up your run volume, and I'm sorry, your, your run training load, so it could be volume, frequency, intensity, those two things won't go up hand in hand. So I would say while you're in a kind of more of a base building phase with your running, feel free just to kind of gradually increase that incrementally, but then get to a place where you're starting to just find your, your dialing in maintenance as you switch to a phase where you're getting more kind of race specific. So let's say you're hitting a, from a, from a base training phase to more of a kind of a half marathon or marathon building block, that's where, as this starts to get more specific, this can just hover and be consistent. Does that make sense? I hope so. There's actually, um, this will be going live in a, a couple of months. Um, there's a, a weight training section to the Bulletproof Runners program as well. Um, I wanted to make sure that we cover that off so people are doing that correctly um, as opposed to kind of leaving people high and dry. But the, the core, the key to the bulletproof, the key, what's the best way of putting it? Yeah, it, the, fun, the fundamentals of the bulletproof program use the principle of empty room, effectively. Okay, so we are getting people using body weight exercises, not needing any kits, not needing any specific, specific equipment to get the exercises done. It is literally using your body weight, using things like, um, if you need to do something like a front foot, front foot elevated hip flexor stretch, you're putting your foot up on a chair, but there's nothing more fancy to it than that. I really want to make this accessible for people, and there's a ton, ton you can get done if you know what you're doing with body weight exercises. It can be seriously hard work. Uh, Liam says, you're a scholar regional athlete, uh, currently deep in track season. Here we are. Uh, you've got a pretty heavy week of training with six runs per week, three SNC, um, all well-placed, yeah. To adapt throughout my man it sounds like you're in a good program right okie dokie so let's get back into uh in some of these questions so yeah the next one that a lot of people ask is shoes on or off and i know we're kind of getting into real kind of i guess nuts and bolts here but just thinking about what i've been asked again and again over the years is do i do these exercises so exercises like i show on the channel here and i may be in the gym here with shoes on or maybe here with gym with shoes off <sighs> Ideally, if you're doing single leg stability exercises, I would go shoes off because it's going to give your feet and your ankles a slightly better work, or if not a slightly better workout, slightly more of a challenge. That's for certain. But a lot of people really struggle with single leg balance work and they find that actually the instability comes from foot and ankle because they haven't got the control, especially the control they're kind of used to. 
So in those instances, that's where I actually, I actually say put your running shoes back on. Because the little bit of stability, the little bit of control that your running shoes, your, your feet are used to getting from your running shoes can put you in a position where you're actually able to be successful with the exercise. And as you get better and better at the exercise, so let's say you're doing something like, let's say you're doing something like a single leg squat or a single leg, um, I don't know, let's go single leg arabesque. Okay, so we're standing on one leg and we're here, 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 here. It's getting into this kind of arabesque position. Once you get good at that and you've got the, the stability and the control, then you can take the shoes off and give your foot that, that challenge once again. But when people are in this position, I know it's a bit far away right now but to see, but we're in this position and all of a sudden the foot is all over the place. You can see how the knee follows and all of a sudden everything's wobbling. You haven't got that stable base to work off. But if instead you're actually creating a little bit more of a stable surface, a little bit more help for the foot, then all of a sudden you're going to allow for success higher up. And all these exercises, okay, especially single leg stuff where we're, where we're working on control, we're working on just getting the, the right patterns when it comes to stability, it's about again and again and again repeating successful movements, teaching your body. It's like teaching your body a language, if that makes sense. Again, it's, it's the neuromuscular link, it's brain and muscle working together. From the brain aspect of that, it is literally like learning a language. You just need immersion. You need to, just, again, hit, 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 success, 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 so your body then understands after a certain volume, oh, this is what I'm meant to be doing. Whereas without that, you get to a point where you get a few good ones, a few bad ones, and your body just doesn't know what it's meant to be remembering and what it's meant to be learning and, and reinforcing, so you don't really see the progress. So instead, giving your foot that support will allow for the success and then over time you can wean that away as you get better and better at it. I feel like I've just rambled my way through that, but did, did you follow along with that? Does, does that make sense? Let me know down in the comments. Uh, Kato says that he's training for a marathon in August. That's fantastic. Again, the Bulletproof Runners program, which is linked down in the description, I'd suggest go and check that out. You've got, depending when in August, you've got a couple of, you may even have three months still before your marathon. Lots of time to integrate strength training in that program and really, really see the benefits, particularly as those longer runs get longer. You know, as you get up to 16, 18, 20 miles with a long run, they, I mean, I hope to goodness, you stay injury free throughout this anyway, but those are the kind of long runs where a lot of the time people start to pick up aches and pains, um, which then turn into injuries. And a lot of the time is because the distance of that long run has outstripped the body's capacity, resilience, ability to maintain good form for those last miles that you perhaps, you know, the program says 20 miles, but perhaps your body realistically is good for 17. And those last three miles, it's a bit kind of, let's say, compromised. Okay, I know I think a lot of us will kind of be able to be familiar with that be able to be familiar with that kind of heavy legged trudge that, uh, that can be the end of a long run. Especially if you've rushed through perhaps a, a marathon plan or you overreach with a marathon plan. Okay, um, taper weeks is the next thing I wanted to talk about. Again, this is, again, it's, I guess, very pertinent as well for you, uh, Kato. So as you get towards your marathon, we taper in terms of our training load, obviously. But in the same conversation as we don't just cut out speed work, okay, we just dial right back on the volume, we can say the same for strength, but in a slightly different way. So I don't want people doing you know, great, big sets of, you know, great big sets of split squats. You know, so in the weeks leading, like the last couple of weeks leading up to World, World Marathon, I'm not going to have people for big sets of you know, three times 15 on each side, maybe with a couple of dumbbells if you're doing weight work, whatever. I'm not gonna have people doing that because those big compound movements, they're gonna take it out of your legs. Okay, we're in this, this taper phase, we want to protect the legs. We want to allow you to recover from the, the kind of the more chronic effect of the months that have just led into this taper so that you can come to race day feeling really fresh and peaking. There's no point in smashing your legs up um, 
you know, two or three times per week during a time when your legs are meant to be you know, feeling the benefit of that rest. Instead, I want to focus on activation exercises. A exercises where we're not going through those big whole body movements, hitting those big muscle groups, making you work hard. Instead, we're being very specific and isolated in making sure that we're switching on our glutes, making sure that we're firing up our core and allowing our body to be ready on race day with the right muscles primed but not fatigued. That's the real key there. So all of a sudden at that point in taper weeks, our program is all about activation exercises and mobility exercises. Okay, we're kind of greasing the cogs and we're making sure we're tuning the engine, if you want to put it like that. Okay, now, that pretty much leaves me now just looking at the comments. Let's have a look. Okay, so Jim, let's have a look at Jim's comments. He says he does three strength sessions per week, shoulders, lower body, arms, back and core, two or three runs per week, park run at Slough Bottom. Jim is a local boy, fantastic. Um, a couple of zone two bike sessions and a VO2 max, ses max, VO2 max session on the rower. Um, not really a competitive not really competitive and running around the streets doesn't really inspire very much. You targeted the, oh, excellent, Hurtwood 50K trail run in December, something that's a challenge to do with some variety. Trail work, fantastic. Um, again, if you're doing three strength sessions per week, shoulder, lower body, arms, core back, that's great. Again, that sounds like perhaps you're doing a little bit more kind of weights focused work. I'd just love to know how we could get you doing a little bit more run specific work with that as well. Um, but it's, there's so much, so much to do with the, the Bulletproof running program there. But you know, everyone that we've spoken about, everyone that's spoken to the comments of this evening, I think would benefit from. So I'm going to leave you with this. Okay, the whole idea of doing a little and often approach to strength and conditioning can be an absolutely huge game changer for your running. Okay, just giving it two to three times per week, 20 minute workouts, hitting those key areas over and over and over consistently, hitting different areas each week. We mix the workouts up each week and we work through, to begin with, it's that foundation program. We work through a progressive 12 weeks of that foundation program. And then we get into our build program. And from there, we've got you know, things like our strength training, you know, our, our resistance training, weights program for those who want it. Um, and it's building out the whole time. If you're interested, on coming, interested in coming on board with the Bulletproof program, check out the link in the description. It's the top link down in the description there. We've currently got 50% off an annual membership. Um, I definitely check that out. It's something which I know will be so beneficial for so many runners because it deals with those key things we spoke about at the start. The lack of time, the lack of knowing which exercises are actually genuinely going to be worth your effort. You know, what are the big bang for buck exercises? The Bulletproof program, we have stuffed full of those big bang for buck exercises so you know that what you're doing is worth your time and not wasting your time. And then the last thing to speak about, which we haven't really so far, is the power of accountability and the power of community. Okay, so those two things go hand in hand with the Bulletproof program. Accountability, well, it's someone who's literally me, someone who's going to be checking in and wanting to see you tell me how many strength conditioning workouts, tell the group how many strength conditioning workouts you've done that week, how they've gone, what you found easy, what you found difficult. And of course, with that kind of contact, that's obviously you know, to say what you've done. The other way around to that as well, the other side to that is at the beginning of the week, if you say, you know what, I twisted my ankle at the weekend uh, over a tree route, it happens. Um, and the single leg exercises we've got laid out this week, and that's a bit much my ankle right now. The benefit is we can just switch things up in nice and easy conversation about, well, don't do that exercise, do that exercise instead, keep it very dynamic. And that's why we have a specific community and group to keep that very, very easy. So I'd urge you, check that out. Let me know, obviously, if you have any questions about it, you, uh, you can just simply ask and I will let you know. All right, I'll speak to you soon. Take care. Bye now.